everybody. Thank you for joining us at the Giving Bass Co- Podcast episode three. Number three. Number we're getting, three. We're pros at this point. We are. Oh, yeah. I'm Colin Tordale, Aaron Throckmorton, your co-host. Um, today, I think we're going to be talking about your elk hunt. Yeah, we had uh, talked about sharing some hunting stories, and that one uh, from last year was quite the hunt. Um, so we were going to kind of share that. I've actually been bow hunting this area. Oh, geez. I started with my first hunt, actually, before I could could hunt. I went with my dad, mm-hmm. and he was bow hunting this mountain range. And I remember going up with him, and oh, my gosh, it was so steep, you know. And, of course, I'm 10 years old or whatever. Right. And we walk up, and, you know, I don't know much about elk hunting, but he had this whistle that he uh, made. And his bugle tube was a vacuum hose <laughs> that he <laughs> painted camouflage. And there was no reeds. There was no calls. But anyway, we get up in his canyon. And at one point, we had seven bulls. I'd never heard an elk before. And I think from that day, I was kind of hooked. And I remember we, we got back to the house. I'm kind of doing a backstory here. But I told him I wanted to take a tape recorder with us because I wanted to capture the sound to share with people. Right. So I've always wanted to do that. But and fast forward. You date yourself there with a tape recorder, right? Oh, boy, buddy, that had to be <laughs> late 70s. <laughs> that was a long time ago. And, yes, we did have color back then. Um, but, no, I've been hunting this this area for years, and I've had, you know, great success over the years. And uh, I took my uh, – all actually, all the archery elk have come off this mountain range. Well, fast forward to, you know, last season, and um, my girlfriend – um, Ozzy, she had never done hardly any kind of hunting. And so I asked her if she wanted to go on an elk hunt with me and, and she did. And so I kind of prepared her for <laughs> what she was going to experience. Um, so before the season, I think it was about two weeks before season, we, uh, took a hike and just kind of went up the trail. Well, unfortunately we had a bad beetle kill up there and the wind had blown down trees. So there was deadfall everywhere. This this loop that I walk is normally about two, I'd say a little under three miles, and it took us almost six just zigzagging back and oh, forth. Wow. You know, and her little legs, I mean, she's going over the deadfall, under the deadfall. But, you know, we got up there, and I took her, took we got home, and I said, what do you think? And she goes, I want to go elk hunting. So I'm like, okay, you know. And you know, man, that opening day, that anticipation. Oh, yes. And I'm so excited, and I'm like, man, I can't wait to – share this with her and, you know, have the elk talk and have the elk bugle. And and so we go up there that first weekend and um, we hiked every ridge. We went through every canyon and we could not find any elk. We ran into that too. Opening weekend, again, the excitement. Um, Yeah. My wife, this is her first year bow hunting, right? So she was super excited too. And we, we go out and we're listening. Ridge after ridge, drainage after drainage nothing nothing's talking it was really bizarre yeah <clears throat> excuse me but that happens with elk hunt right it does i've always said elk are the most bipolar animal on the planet because one day they won't be there the next day they won't shut up and so but we hiked and we spent two days up there um i introduced her to sleeping on the mountain mm-hmm. in a small tent on the ground so and how was that well you know um 10 years ago it wasn't bad as I get older, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts a lot. But we made it through the night. She was a trooper. Again, she's never done anything like this. And we we got off the mountain. I think all we saw that that weekend was a spike mule deer buck. Um, but we got off the mountain and she and you know, she was very appreciative and she had a good time and and she said, you know, I kinda wanna go back all year. And so we had planned to go back most weekends. Um but she was talking about, you know, we didn't see any elk. Are they typically there? I mean, I think she's starting to question some things, you know, and, and, and I get it. So we get prepared. We go up, you know, the following week and we get way off the other side. And as I'm walking down through the timber, I look up and there's a six point bull. Now we had been calling, we've been talking and he just bedded down. And so I kind of, I, I kind of got down on, on one knee I motioned for her to get down. She really didn't know what was happening at this point. Um, but then she got closer to me. I had her scooting and she could see this elk. It was the first elk she'd ever seen in the wild. Oh, wow. And the look on her face. I mean, I had no shot opportunity. It was actually bedded down. It was 70 yards. Um, but I gave her the camera. And I said, here, try and film it. You know, because we were filming an episode of the show. And she did a really good job capturing this elk. But, 
you know, like all elk hunts happen within the first four minutes, the wind hits in the back of the neck. Oh, yes. And I, we were talking earlier today how many elk hunts that we've had ruined by the wind. Yeah. Uh, this was one of them because this bull was very close to the top. And where I hunt, we, we start on one side of the mountain and we climb up. And that same canyon I was talking about where my dad and I hunted, the elk have moved out of there over the years. And they just don't stay there anymore. So they're on the other side. So it takes about three hours to kind of get into the elk. But we were near the top and I thought, man, if I could shoot this bull, he's not going to be hard to pack out. Right. Now, not hard? Well, it's still <laughs> going to be hard. But Relative it's not going to be as hard, correct. Yes. But anyway, the wind swirled, you know, and he took off. We, uh, I told her, I said, well, um, there's no sense chasing that elk. Once they smell you, you're not going to call him back and he's going to leave. And it was getting pretty close to dark anyway. So we go back up, um, slept on the mountain again, <laughs> slept on the ground again. I think we did start a campfire that night. So at least we had a little bit of company up there, but, uh, woke up the next day. And again, I'm like, man, I just, you know, you have those days in the mountains during elk season where you hear a bull, a bull bugle and then another one. And and pretty soon you have five or six bulls going back and forth. You don't even have to talk. And I really wanted her to experience that. But I thought, well, maybe the next day we looked and the weather was calling for a, a few rain showers that afternoon. I said, okay, that might be a good thing. We go off that, that hill that morning and it is dead. And there is nothing talking. There's no fresh sign. We're sitting there. And finally, that, that afternoon, I did a cow call, and this bull answers. Well, then the rain started to come, and then the sleet, and then the hail, and then the snow. <laughs> All seasons. All seasons hit us at once. Now, I knew better, but the day before, it was in the 80s. And so we had some light gear on. and But this bull was talking now. Don't get me wrong. I was cold, but I'm like, man, if this bull comes up, Oh, we're going to have an opportunity. And I remember looking back and poor Ozzy. I mean, she's being a trooper. She's not complaining, but she's shaking so bad that I could hear it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she was so cold. And I was like, oh, man. And the more she started to shake, the more that bull started to bugle. So now I'm like, what do I do? I Tell I, her to keep shaking. That's what I thought. <laughs> I told her, I said, look, I don't think we can leave. We got a, a bull that's, that's pretty interested. But I saw the look on her face because she agreed. She goes, yeah, we can stay. And I could see right across her face. No, I don't no. want to stay here. I don't want to be here. It's, yes, we can stay, right? <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Head shaking, no. And yeah. I'll be honest with you, if I'm being totally transparent, I was saying that too. Right. I was like, no, we can't go. Yeah, we need to go. We need to go. And it was cold. But anyway, that bull ended up stopping. And then we <clears throat> got to the top of the mountain and it was just complete ice. And we still had two miles to go downhill with all of our gear and everything like that. So it was just a treacherous hike out. So, you know, the first weekend we're up there, we don't see an elk. I walked probably 15 miles with her. Um, the next weekend, obviously, we saw the one bull, but then the ice storm came in. And so I'm like, man, I, I don't want to just discourage this you know, woman here who wants to get into hunting and wants to try this. So I told her, I said, look, this is elk hunting and yes. you're going to have your bad days. And you're going to have your good days. But unfortunately, all of ours have been pretty bad. And so. Which is funny because, you know, as people talk about their stories or elk experience or hunting experiences, you never talk about the days of seeing nothing, boredom, nothing happening, which happens a lot. That's the majority of it. But everybody has this in their mind, even watching hunting TV shows, that, oh, you just go out there, you're going to see all these animals all the time. No. 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 I'm sorry. And I and that's one reason we talked about uh, giving back TV and I started it. Because I'm watching these shows as a younger guy and I'm seeing in 22 and a half minutes, these guys are into elk every minute of the yes. hunt. That is not accurate. No. If you're hunting public land and you're in the backcountry, you're going to have days where you don't, you think you're the only person alive on the planet. Yes. There is nothing around. And so I wanted to share that. Well, unfortunately, this was coming true this season. <laughs> and I really wanted, you know, Ozzy to, to see what a, a fun elk hunt was like. So the next weekend, um, she couldn't get off. I think it was a Friday. And I said, hey, I'm going to go up to camp. And I'm going to, you know, do a little bit of hunting Friday. I'll meet you halfway in the mountain and then we can hunt that weekend. Okay, great. I uh, t 
took all day. I, I spent half a day climbing this mountain, calling, just taking my time. And I got up to camp late in the afternoon. And um, I had left my tent up because we had come off the mountain two days before. And so I said, um, let me just leave this up here. When I got to the tent, it was ripped. And, I, and I see this. And then I see my sleeping pad laying out on the ground. And I'm like, well, this isn't good. So I go up there and I drop my pack and I look and um, you could see where a bear had come through and scratched, well, shredded, yeah. I should say, the tent. He had pulled out both of our sleeping pads, um, punctured them. He had, uh, I had a pair of sandals even up there. He ate one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what his menu's like, but um, shredded our pillows. I mean, so I couldn't even stay on the mountain. So I, you know. I, I had my cell phone with me. I called her and I said, hey, we're not going to be able to hunt this weekend. I said, our camp is destroyed. So that weekend, instead of elk hunting, we had went and we bought a new tent, new sleeping pads. New, you know, so here's another two grand. Gone. Thanks, Mr. Bear. Yeah. The bear came through, had a great old time. So now we're three weeks into season. I'm <laughs> like, holy cow. This, I mean, I didn't even know if she wanted to go back anymore. <clears throat> but anyway, I said, well... You know, we should go up this next weekend. It's, I think they're going to be rutting pretty hard. I think it's going to be really good, you know, and I'm in the back of my mind. I know it's, I'm not sure if I'm even telling the truth. Right. You know, but I wanted to kind of keep her spirits up, but. Way to sell it. I, I sold it hard. <laughs> I did, but I didn't even have to because Ozzy's such a trooper and she, she just liked being out in nature. She did. But I was like, okay, I think this weekend's going to be good. So that Saturday morning, we start hiking up the mountain, and I said, we're just going to go as slow as we can, and we're going to call and listen and do all this stuff. We get to the top of the mountain, still nothing. I mean, nothing at all. Not a bugle, um, no, no fresh sign, no tracks. We get up, we set up our camp, and um, I told her, I said, let's just drop off the other side of the mountain, and let's just spend, I said, we're not going to go far, but let's just spend the afternoon listening. You know, we'll listen, we'll call a little bit. So we got down there and we had kind of set up and um, I called nothing. Wait 20 minutes, call nothing. So it was about five o'clock or excuse me, about 430. And I said, let's just make some dinner. Let's just, we had our jet boil. And so we cooked, we ate some dinner and I'm putting stuff away. And I said, I, I really think we should just go back to camp. I said, it's, we only have a couple hours of daylight left anyway. And so we're getting our gear together. And as I stand up, I had a different, uh, cow call in my pocket, one that's really obnoxiously loud. And I, I joked and I said, look, I'm going to blow this. And if there's anything from here, a hundred miles away, they're going to answer. And she's like, do it, do it. And I blew this thing. And before I got done, this bull answered. Oh, wow. And she looked at me and she's like, is that an elk? I'm like, yeah, I think so. Cause typically where we hunt, there's not a lot of other hunters up there, but there's still that chance it could yes. be a hunter. So I stand there for a minute. I do it again. And he answers. And then he called back without me even having to cow call. And I looked at her. I'm like, he's coming. We got to go. So we're throwing stuff in our backpacks. And I'm thinking, man, this is the only action we've had in, in a month. And we go down this hill. And I remember as I'm going down the hill, my feet slipped out from underneath me. Oh. And <laughs> let me back up. Right before this, I told her, I said, we need to go down this hill very fast, but very quiet. Yes. I turn into dad mode. Yeah. Must be quiet now. Just we don't want to scare, scare this like, elf. Shh. Yeah. So I go off the hill. My feet slide up. Wham! I hit the ground. <laughs> my <laughs> bow hits the ground. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I probably made more noise than anything in the world. She helps me up. We get up. And um, I said, well, let's keep going down the hill. We get down around this around these trees. And we only went maybe 40 yards. That was it. And he bugles. Oh, and wow. I'm like, man, he is close. And I said, he's coming. So... I got positioned and I kind of got Ozzy off on my left-hand side and there was a big opening below us. And I said, okay, I'm going to call him right here. So here I'm telling her where I'm going to pull this elk into. Right. Yeah, that'd have been great. Right. Didn't happen like that. <laughs> but I start calling, he's answering and he's getting closer and closer. And so I had handed her the camera and I said, just film it. And she had never filmed in her life really. You know, she'd played around with it that season a little bit. But here this elk is bugling and just screaming. And I, at one point I looked at her and her eyes are so wide because, you know, that sound that it just echoes oh, yes. off the hills. 
and uh and, and then on top of that i gave her the camera and i'm like hey you got to capture this for the tv show ah, nice boyfriend right. huh? <laughs> but i it's see it's all on you honey it's, it's all on you yeah we, we we live or die by you oz <laughs> so we uh we're standing there and i finally saw just antlers coming through and instead of coming below us he was going way above us almost mm-hmm. to where we were at the first time and so did a very small cow call and i saw him turn and he walked head on and he's walking 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 and in the video you can hear me say <clears throat> excuse me are you recording yes i'm recording and she was and but all she could see was my backpack that mm-hmm. was it that was it and she couldn't like get around me she got around me a little bit and you can see the elk coming through the timber and um, he comes around, comes around, and I pull back. And at this point, I'm all I have is a head-on shot, which I've told people a million times, I don't like those shots. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just that window so small. But he was like 18, 19 yards. And I actually let the arrow fly and hit him. But everything happened so fast in that moment. He ran up the hill. So instantly I grabbed the cow call. I'm cow calling because I don't know how good the hit is or anything right. like that. And he stops and hits and slides right back down the hill and maybe 10 yards but he ran uphill and not downhill right that never happens and um and so i turn to her and i see the red light on the camera it's still blinking but i don't know what she's captured and so i'm talking to her and i got really emotional and um i was talking to her after the season or after after we got the bull down and I said, man, I, I don't know why I got so emotional. And she goes, I did too. And I said, I think it was just the whole year. We had gotten basically our butts handed to us mm-hmm. by the weather, the bear. the bear, you know, had to buy new camp. This Down was the most timber. expensive elk we had yeah. ever got. But, you know, we got up to the elk. And um, like I say, Ozzy hadn't done a lot of hunting. The only hunting she had done before this was with me in Africa mm-hmm. about, I don't know, three months before this, where... Like we said in a previous episode, you shoot your animal and you sit there sipping a soda. Well, they yes. prep it for pictures and then they take it and skin it. Yeah, we get up to this elk and uh, we turn the camera off and she goes, now what do we do? And I said, do you get comfortable? <laughs> We're here. And so mm-hmm. she had no idea. We start cutting on this thing and we got all the quarters off, got the head off, got the back straps off and got it kind of all in game bags. And then by that time, it's dark. It's pitch black. And she goes, well, now what? And I said, well, how strong are you feeling? <laughs> she goes, I can help out. So I put a hind quarter on myself, and I think she took a front quarter. Oh, wow. And we got up to camp, laid the meat out. And then, you know, lucky enough, where I hunt is only about, you know, 20, 25 minutes from my, my parents and my brother. So I called my brother, and I said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? He's like, you got one down, didn't you? Yeah. And I said, I did. You want to be a pack mule? I said, would you like to come up and haul elk? You haven't done yeah. that in a while. Right. And I don't even think my brother had hunted on that hill this year. And that hill is so steep, it takes you a while to get acclimated. But, you know, the next morning he called and he goes, hey, we're going to we're gonna start up the mountain, him and my nephew, Archer. And so they, they were coming up. We went off the other side, Oz and I did, got the rest of the elk and brought it up. The only thing we didn't take out was a hind quarter. And when I was skinning that elk, we pulled the hide back and we could smell something. And the more we pulled it back, it was just gangrene from like the last rib all the way down to his hip. Oh, wow. And I think a bull had gotten into a big fight mm-hmm. with a bull. So we unfortunately, I took some pictures of that in case a game warden never wanted to see it. But we lost a whole hind quarter, which that's some of the best part right. of that elk. But no, we got that elk out and um, got to the top and met my brother, my nephew, and got all loaded down and um that was a long day man oh. i mean uh hauling that elk out it was i mean there was three of us that did it but even without that hind quarter there was so much weight on all of our backs oh absolutely i know i know what that's like and <clears throat> being in somewhere even by myself like i'm two three miles in and i have an elk coming in or something i'm like i have to get this out and it's ever since my folks sold their horses, I'm like, I don't have that quick phone call. Like, hey, bring the horses. Yeah. It's all on me now. It's like, oh, do I shoot it or not? I've done that, man. And like I say, we're not 20 anymore. No. You know, stuff hurts. And, you know, even, you know, this this past season, this the elk I'm talking about was two seasons ago, actually. This past season, I was hunting by myself and I was way down the bottom in this just, lack of a better term, kind of a hellhole. And I had a bull answer instantly. 
and he sounded big. And I always said, I'm not going to shoot anything in this in this canyon unless it's a big bull. But he sounded massive. So I knocked an arrow, and I kind of backed up a little bit, and he's running through the timber, and I see branches are breaking. And he comes around the corner, and he's at 10 yards. He's looking at me, and he was a 5x5. Five five. Oh, wow. So I looked at him, and he looked at me, and this is a true story. I, I unknock my arrow as I'm looking at him. And he runs about 30 yards, looks back over his shoulder and starts grazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have a first-time hunter with me, they would have had their elk. But right. No, I, I've done the same thing. I've passed up elk. But no, that elk, I wanted to tell that story because for a couple reasons. One, there are elk seasons like that where you aren't going to get into elk every day. Right. You know, I've had elk seasons where I can go up there and tell you where they're going to be, where they're sleeping. But, you know, elk are very... Uh, and unpredictable. They, unpredictable. They change their patterns a lot. They do. And especially during the rut, you never know where you're going to find them. Typically elk, though, for people wanting to get into it, if you find a breeding ground, they're going to go back year after year yes. in that same area. And, I mean, their habits might change a little bit. But even on your slow years, we were able to get that, that elk down. It was a nice elk. He was a six by seven. I mean, he had some short points mm-hmm. on him, but a nice, nice mature bull. Um, but, man, those shows on TV – it can happen like that, it, but yeah. typically it doesn't. You're going to have to just grind through those slow days if you want to be successful. Absolutely. I mean, I've been out hunting, and I say that every day I was, we were into elk, which means we saw elk on a hillside. might have been across the drainage or even up close, but like you said, wind swirls, things like that. But then that's only a few days, and then the rest of the time is dry. <clears throat> it's like yes. searching, hunting reason it's called hunting right you're yeah. looking for these things these critters in this vast wilderness and trying to get within bow especially bow hunting within oh. bow range i mean we're talking 40 yards or so or less especially in timber you're going to be less than that um yeah and it's just it's tough it's really tough and that's what people don't don't realize i mean and that's one of my problems i have with some of the shows is they make it look so easy mm-hmm. and i've had easy elk hunts i went out one morning and one hour later i had a bull down he just happened to walk in front of me. Right. That stuff can happen. But for the most part, elk hunting, especially with a bow, I always tell everyone it's the most frustrating hunt I've ever done, but it's the most fun hunt. Most fun. And the one I look forward to every year. And you keep going back. Like, you keep going back. Like, how did I get my wife hooked on it? Um, we we're at, by our cabin in Lincoln, Montana, and uh, <clears throat> there's elk across the river. So my son and I go in, and it was so thick. I mean, we had to get on our hands and knees, look under branches, and you could see uh, legs moving through the trees. Super quiet. It just rained. So we're walking through there. And then we followed them out of that patch and they crossed the main road. As we get closer to the main road, there's my wife and my daughter standing there waving at us with these big white gloves on. I'm like, hey, yeah, hey, look at me, look at me. I'm like, put your hands down. <laughs> you know, help just walk through here. Well, I didn't know that they went and hid in the bush and the whole herd of elk walked by them within 20 yards. Oh, that had to be a great experience for them. Oh, yeah. They are, they love elk hunting now and going out you know once people experience that the you are hooked oh yes absolutely. you are hooked it's there's nothing like being that close to elk hearing them bugle and even hearing the cows communicate when those elk communicate it is unbelievable because they all talk it's crazy and absolutely one of our experiences up there in lincoln we we're um it was three or four days before bow season opened we're out just scouting and we see this big herd of elk and <clears throat> across the road we see a couple calves that are behind the fence and they're just chattering away and the other herd has already moved over the hill across the way and we're sitting there listening and just these cows are just these calves are just being all sorts of noise all of a sudden that whole herd come back and the whole hillside erupted with elk chatter i've never heard that many elk at one time talk the whole herd was talking the calves were talking they were coming back for them Oh, man. So the elk, the bulls are bugling, all the cows, this whole herd just moving through this whole big open clearing toward us. So we just got out of the truck and walked down to the trees, and they're all around us. And then six cows took off running, jumped the fence, went to those calves, got them back, and then wow. took them back into the herd. It's incredible. It was amazing. It's incredible. And I always tell people, if you haven't done archery elk hunting and you're thinking about do it, just do it. Oh, yes. you got to do it. I mean, call me. We have guided elk hunts. Yes. Uh, we can get you on a guided hunt, which that isn't the worst way to go. Um, a lot of times people, if you've never elk hunted before, sure, you can try it on your own if you're coming from the East Coast or the Midwest, but you got to find an area. you got to find the gear. How do you how do you call the elk? How do you talk to the elk? That's right. very important knowing what they're saying. Sometimes going with the guide is if, you know, I grew up doing it. A lot yeah. of people haven't had that 
that's right and you can go from fully guided where it's yeah. a very similar experience that we talked about in africa right where you get an animal down yes. they're taking care of you everything else to a semi diy hunt where they will pack you in leave you at camp it's on your own yes. but you call them and they'll come pack it out for you there's, which is there's nice. all sorts of different ways to do it. There's so many ways to do it or just go with a buddy, do it. But yes. yeah, archery elk hunting, uh, if you guys haven't done it, do it. It is honestly one of the best hunts that you'll ever do. Yes. Once it gets in your blood, once you hear that first elk bugle or uh, call or respond to one of your calls, it's like, oh, this is exciting. <laughs> it's funny because in our podcast, we've talked about Africa. Yes. It gets in your blood. Elk hunting, it gets in your blood. I think most hunting gets in your blood, All hunting, but there, think, yeah. but there's some that are on different levels, and elk hunting is on its own level. It it, it can compete with Africa. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, no, that was our story that year. I mean, that was you know the the actual hunting that whole month of September was very very slow, and we just like I said got our butt kicked. But in the end, we got lucky, and yeah. we had one bull that wanted to play and. He came into bow range and we got him. So the, it, it can happen like that. So, yeah, I just kind of wanted to share with everyone that's typically how elk hunting goes. Yes. And I call it uh, for the elk, it's a terminal game of Marco Polo. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. That's is. I've never heard that before, but that's perfect. Right. So, anyway, well, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, this was number three. N- number three. Like, subscribe, whatever that button shows you down below. Um, yeah, we don't know what the button is yet. But yeah, but it, it'll the be one there. that you're seeing, hit it. So. Yeah, and then uh, if you ever want any of these hunts, get hold of us. We can uh, we can figure something out for you. See you next Thanks. week, guys. See you. Bye. If any of you want to go on any of these hunts or trips around the world that we talk about on this podcast, True Flight Adventures can help you with every step of the way. Get a hold of us either by calling or emailing, and we can get you on that trip of a lifetime. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to hear more of our stories and commentary, or something to sleep to, be sure to follow us on Spotify, Google Podcast, or Apple Podcast. If you enjoy watching us ramble on, then subscribe on YouTube or Carbon TV. Until next time on Giving Back TV Podcast.